Are you excited? It seems that way. <laughs> Where are those tambourines? You were great this morning. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, everybody. I'm Carol Becker, Dean of the School of the Arts. And we welcome all of you and everyone who's returned. It's so thrilling to see you all back. And we're going to have a great party after all this, too. Um, OK, so as is our custom, I'm going to begin with the School of the Arts land acknowledgement. The School of the Arts recognizes Manhattan as part of the ancestral and traditional homeland of the Lene, Lenape, and Wappinger people. By acknowledging these legacies of displacement, migration, settlement, and occupation, we're taking a small first step towards a long overdue process of healing and repair. And in this spirit, the School of the Arts continues to address issues of exclusion, erasure, and systemic discrimination through education and a commitment to equitable representation. Let's begin. I want to thank the amazing Columbia University Student Jazz Ensemble, and I really would love to thank them for their extraordinary skill and also for their very deconstructed version of Elgar's Pomp and Circumstance, which you might have noticed, um, adapted just for us. And I'd like them to come out and take a bow. Where are they? Thank you. Welcome to our graduating classes of 2022 and to the virtually graduated classes of 2020 and 2021 who have returned to be with us today. We are thrilled to see you all here. Parents, friends, faculty, staff, students, alumni, all who have joined us and of course to our graduation speaker, the magnificent Lori Anderson, an alumna of Barnard College and of the School of the Arts, an artist we admire tremendously, someone of great creativity and integrity, and we are all extremely grateful to her that she agreed to be with us in this very historic graduation. The biggest one yet. It is always a daring experiment and a true leap of faith to come to art school. You have to trust in the importance of your own creativity above all else, and you have to trust that time spent developing your skills at Columbia University will be essential to your ability to navigate the worlds of visual art, sound arts, theater, writing, filmmaking, as well as film and media studies. And you have to believe that having developed these potentialities in yourself will prepare you to engage the most pressing issues of our times in really unique forms. So let us first congratulate the class of 2022 for their boundless courage, originality, boldness, and conviction. They have worked extremely hard, and they've achieved so much already. And let us also applaud our one students and now alumni who have returned from the classes of 2020 and 2021 who navigated their time at the school under extraordinarily difficult circumstances and nonetheless produced incredible work in spite of this adversity. We are extremely proud of all of you. And after today, you will all be our alumni and forever part of Columbia University School of the Arts. So let's applaud all the classes. In the last weeks, all the school's programs have been enlivened by end of the year festivals, exhibitions, performances, and publications. This year, for the first time in three years, in person. We thank you, our students, for your brilliantly directed, acted, conceptualized, managed, and produced Columbia New Plays Festival, the directors and actors' thesis productions and showcases. We thank you for the beautifully written and designed writer's thesis anthology, as well as for the monumental visual arts and sound arts thesis exhibitions held at Lentfest Center for the Arts. We greatly admire the astounding week of scholarly thesis presentations 
uh, by our film and media studies students at Zoom In, as well as the Columbia University Film Festival with new short films, screenplays, television writing by our incredibly accomplished filmmakers at the Lenfest Center for the Arts, the Riverside Church, and the Directors Guild of America. Graduation this year is comprised of students from most states in the US as well as 47 countries. We cherish this national and global breadth that so reflects the spirit of the 21st century and enriches the education of all of us. We learn about cultural and social difference from each other and we create collaborations and friendships across multiple geographies and orientations to time and place that can last a lifetime. Because we have bonded with you all as students, fellow artists, scholars, colleagues, and alumni, we're really sad to see you leave, but we're also really excited that so many of you have returned today, and we are very confident that we have prepared you well to enter your various professions and to challenge the boundaries of form while inventing new ones along the way, whenever, wherever you can. Always remember that without imagination, we cannot envision what does not already exist. The world needs artists trained to keep their imaginations alive and engaged, and that is your job. School of the Arts alumni and faculty are everywhere successful in all important art, film, academic, theatrical, and literary venues around the world. In a short time, you, the class of 2022, also will become part of this illustrious group. The classes of 2020 and 21 already have. No one except your friends and family will ever be as proud of you or as excited about your new work and successes in the world as the faculty and staff at the School of the Arts. So remember to stay close. Always let us know what you're up to, how your careers are progressing, and we'll do everything we can to get the word out. Speaking of families and friends, let us acknowledge those without whom many of you would never have completed this most essential part of your development as artists. Will the families and friends of all of our graduates please stand? We also wish to acknowledge those. <laughs> we also want to acknowledge those who are watching this graduation in many parts of the world on our live stream. So families and friends, wherever you are, know you are enormously appreciated. No one can succeed alone. We all need people close to us who care about us and support us in all ways because they believe in what we do. You have been essential to this process. Will all the families, friends, partners, companions, and loved ones of our graduates, present and virtual, please stand. So I'm hoping people are standing all around the world right now with us. <laughs> Now for a moment to thank the faculty. I would venture to say that there is no more devoted and successful faculty anywhere in the world than ours. All are working artists, practicing and engaged in many forms, yet they nonetheless give so much of their time, imaginations and wisdom to our students. They transmit knowledge of their disciplines, but also the knowledge of what it means to be a practicing artist, writer, scholar, filmmaker, theater practitioner and so forth and what it means to do it for your whole life. How does one keep that creative spirit alive? They are there to help convey the very important messages of navigating such an original life. Testimony to their extraordinary commitment is that in the past 11 years, our faculty have won the much coveted Presidential Outstanding Teaching Award six times more than any other school at Columbia University. And we have a lot of competition with those big schools like law, medicine. So now let's ask our faculty present to please stand and be acknowledged by their students and colleagues, including those on stage, including those on stage. <laughs> okay. I hope that all the families and friends who are here will get to meet some of the faculty at the party after. It really takes our entire team to make graduation possible. So let me thank in particular Layla Mayer, Dean of Students and Alumni Affairs, Trent Pollard, Assistant Director of Alumni Affairs, Carly Rodriguez, who's graduating today, Assistant Director of Student Affairs, 
<coughs> Joe Novak, director of production. Our student stage managers, Jonah Yoder and Sam Clark. Gavin Browning, director of public programs. Peter Vaughn, director of technology. Christina, <laughs> Christina Tate, director of communications. Roberta Albert, dean of development. I want to thank my assistant, Nora Thomas, who is graduating today as well. And, and to Emerald Curry, assistant general manager of the university events, who's a 20, 13 alum of our writing program, and Britta Kuhn, who is a theater acting alum from 2019, who has been stage managing us today. Um, I want to thank you to all of our volunteers. We just couldn't do it without everyone. I want to thank the Interdisciplinary Arts Council that is the mainstay of student life at the School of the Arts, leaders who are willing to give so much while they're in school to all of the students. And I would like to thank the directors of academic administration who with the chairs will be facilitating the handing of diplomas today. Hana Sifu in film. <laughs> Lauren Elmore, theater. <laughs> Laura Mosqueda in visual arts. <laughs> Frank Winslow in writing. And I of course have to acknowledge our brilliant Dean of Academic Administration, Jana Wright, for everything she does for the school. Let's now really begin, and opening the program will be our Chair of Visual Arts, artist Nicola Lopez, who's going to be introducing, going to be introducing Lori Anderson. Thank you. I am truly, truly thrilled to introduce our guest speaker today, Lori Anderson. Lori Anderson is often described as pioneering, groundbreaking, and ahead of her time. I would argue that her artwork is actually of our time, in the most salient and compelling of ways. In a vibrant and prolific career that has spanned decades, she has engaged storytelling and technology to create immersive performances, experimental music, films, and standalone artworks that touch on themes of freedom and control, surveillance, identity, and time. Of all of the really cool things you can do as a visual artist and a performance artist and a theater artist and a musician, Lori Anderson has done just about all of them. To begin with, like you, she earned her MFA from Columbia University in visual arts. In an early performance work, Duets on Ice, she played the violin while wearing ice skates frozen in blocks of ice, measuring time through ice melt. The performance ended when her skates were melted free. Not only does music and composition permeate her work across artistic mediums, she has invented her own experimental musical instruments. She has cut several albums, one of the best known being Big Science, which includes the 1981 hit single, Oh Superman, which I might be listening to obsessively in my studio these days. She has made many films, including directing and starring in Home of the Brave in 1986. She was NASA's first artist in residence in 2003, which inspired her performance piece, The End of the Moon. She has collaborated with countless notable artists, including Trisha Brown, William Burroughs, Lou Reed, Philip Glass, Christian McBride, and Kronos Quartet, to name just a few. She has received numerous honors, among which are a Guggenheim Fellowship, a residency at the American Academy in Rome, a Grammy Award, and a Yoko Ono Courage Award for the Arts. Her work has been performed and shown around the world, including at the Brooklyn Academy of Music, Lincoln Center, the Park Avenue Armory, MoMA and Guggenheim Museum here in New York, the 2010 Olympic Games in Vancouver, and the Centre Georges Pompidou in Paris. An extensive exhibition of her work titled The Weather is currently on view now through the end of July at the Smithsonian's Hirschhorn Museum in Washington. Laurie Anderson fearlessly exposes the endless dimensions of wonder, beauty, and ferocity that our world holds. Her work shows us the future that resides within our present. Please welcome Laurie Anderson. Thank you so much, Nicola. Uh, I'd like to thank you for inviting me to talk today. And I understand there are people here who graduated virtually in 20 and 21. And I'm guessing that that ceremony is something like, you know, getting a brief message in your inbox. OK, you've graduated. That's it. Goodbye. So welcome. It's nice to s that you made it today. And you already know what it's like out there. So I'm going to do my best to say a few things that might, might be useful to you, as well as to the people who are just wrapping it up this week. 
Now, I just realized that I got my MFA from the school in 1972. And for me, it would be like having a speaker at our ceremony who graduated from Columbia in 1922. I mean, Warren G. Harding was president uh, at that time. And this theoretical speaker might have been telling us about the 19th Amendment, which was about to be ratified, how horses, you know, were running into cars on the Upper West Side, and maybe something about the beginning of the Roaring Twenties and, you know, various other things that just uh, that you talk about in speeches like this. I mean, it's really hard to write these kind of speeches. Uh, but I don't know about you, but I, I am really losing track of time. I mean, the pandemic has made the recent past so vague. And wh when I run into people now and we say, yeah, when did we meet last? Um, was it maybe two years? No, maybe it could have been five. Anyway, before the pandemic, maybe. I mean, nobody's sure what time it is. Now, many of you came here to New York in a very complicated moment. Maybe like me, you came from somewhere else thinking you'd be landing in glamorous, dark, and exciting New York City, the city you'd seen in movies and read about in art books. So the shock must have been like huge. The hospital tents set up in Central Park, the empty streets, the desolation, no classes, no people on campus, no campus. And so what is this, some kind of weird detour in my life, maybe a test, you know, just kind of hard to say really. Now the pandemic was so many things that we're only gradually understanding but it did remind me a lot of New York in the 70s, dark and dangerous and people helping each other in new ways and, and all sorts of uh, amazing uh, potential. But cities are dreams and they're made of dreams and stories. And in our so-called information era, it's stories that shape the world. And then in the last few years, many of these stories have become completely bizarre. They're packed with conspiracy theories and news of pedophilia rings working out of pizza parlors, just to, you know, about anything can seem pretty real when it's wrapped up in high-tech media and presented with a straight face as the news. And people actually believe this stuff to the point that half the country now thinks the other half is literally crazy. It's really a, a war, a reality war, and it's escalating every day. We're drowning in our own stories. But the good thing about this is that you, artists, visual artists, writers, filmmakers, theater makers, are actually trained to tell stories. You have the means of the media to essentially redefine the world, define who we are and how we see it. Plus, you can do practically any, anything and call it art thanks to the ingenuity of artists who in the past 100 years began claiming huge domains of human activity and production as art. Now there's now landscape art, earth art, performance art, endurance art, story art, tech art, joke art, knitted art. You can walk into a museum and just about every activity can now be called art. Not to mention that the word art means also well done and can include virtually anything. You know, the art of war, the art of love, the art of persuasion, the art of fashion, the art of the deal as well as the lost arts, not to mention all the dark arts. So graduating from an art school is training for basically everything. You're set. Of course, <laughs> the dominant story of our time is the capitalist culture that we swim in without necessarily being very aware of how it shapes what we make and what we do. And I'm thinking now of Mark Fisher and his book, Capitalist Realism, which begins with the sentence, it's easier to imagine the end of the world than it is to imagine the end of capitalism. So what is this world driven by money and fame and branding? And how do you make art within it? And what is real and what's just another story? And another question, should we even try to change the world with art? When people say they want to make the world a better place, I think, better for who? For you and your friends? Plus, art can become propaganda in a second. I really don't like being told what to do and I think, you don't even know me. You know, don't tell me what to do. Although, lately, I really find myself admiring the work of Nan Golden, who got the name Sackler removed from major museums. And yes, and the work of Philip Glass, who made the Aprasachagraha, the Sanskrit word for tooth force, and all the other artists who get engage with the world in this way. Now, I also admire the tactics of Me Too and Black Lives Matter. Both are efforts to change the world through forceful, thought-provoking action. And while it's true that Me Too ignored due process and caused some real damage to innocent people, it also accomplished more towards the ideal of fair treatment of women in the workplace than 100 years of polite tactics and saying the word please again and again. But these 
are desperate times, and it's hard to ignore rage and it collapse. And make no mistake, even if you choose to respond to them by pushing them away or becoming numb, they are still there. So for years, we were like sleepwalking to one of the early episodes of The Handmaid's Tale, and suddenly we're in season four. And it's not looking like a good one. It's more like a hunting season. In Texas, the ban has, been, has, the, has the added uh, poisonous twist of a monetary incentive for vigilantes, citizens turning each other in for money. But as New Yorkers, yet another thing to be proud of today is the bill that was introduced in the New York Assembly last week, Geraldine Santoro Act of 2022. And it is the first step in creating a national, nationwide sanctuary to protect the reproductive rights of women. At least we won't have to be driving people to Canada in the near future, <laughs> New York City. Now there are many things I want to say to you today about art and freedom and rage and opportunity. And don't forget the background for all of this is anxiety. The anxiety we all have. Anxiety which is the cost of living in a destabilized country. Now once I asked Phil Glass how he deals with stress, and he said, I acknowledge it. And I think about that a lot today. And, and I'm, I'm going to try to tell you about a few ways that I've found to live and make art in the age of rage. In a world where money and fame are the engines, and a corporate world where art has become blockbuster entertainment or innovative technology that looks a lot like art, or um, art that has become a, a basically a, a investment, and art that has literally become money itself. Now you're artist, and that means that the materials and means that you're using are artful ones, and you can uh, make work that can challenge its own meaning and its own context. And just as an important footnote, I'm not saying that art needs to be politically engaged uh, with the world, making things that are beautiful and fascinating and baffling and have absolutely no political stance, making things that are from another realm uh, take us out of time and out of our minds is one of the most exalted of human endeavors. So there's that. And as you sit here today looking at all these options, these many different ways to make work, it must be kind of exhilarating as well as, quite frankly, kind of totally exhausting. Now, when I got about out of art school, I had absolutely no idea what to do. So I decided to stay in bed until I could think of a really good reason to get up. So I stayed in bed for months, and I, I would just lie there and look at the sky and kind of drift. And at, th at the time, I could afford to do this because I taught at night school, mostly accountants and secretaries who were on the slow track, going to school two nights a week for about 10 years. And I didn't have to go to work until about, you know, six in the evening. And mostly the people in the class were really late anyway and just, you know, too tired to concentrate. So I was teaching. Egyptian architecture and Assyrian sculpture, but I wasn't really keeping up with the Egyptological journals. So a slide would come up, and, and I would look at it, and I would just draw a complete blank. I, I couldn't remember a single thing about it. So I would just make things up about this or that pharaoh, and the students would write it down, and I would test them on it. <laughs> now, I figured so much history is speculation that, anyway, that maybe it was important to design theories for certain unexplainable things, like, in some of the pyramids, there are lots of these holes on the exterior, the shape of mailbox slots, and they were connected by a long shaft that ran at an odd angle down into the core of the pyramid into the mummy's chamber. And nobody knew why the, sl the slots and shafts were there. So what I told the students was that the slots and shafts were oriented to the sun, so that only on one day a year, let's say, for example, this for the sake of argument, the mummy's birthday, the sun would stream down the shaft into the inner chamber and shine into the mummy's eyes and wake him up. Now, eventually, I, I did feel a little guilt about this, since this was supposedly a history course and not, you know, free-form fiction. So <laughs> I quit. Uh, not, not before I was fired, but it was <laughs> very, very close. Now, me, when I graduated in 1972, I was not in a rush. This wasn't that long after the 60s, when no one was, was in a rush. We were just going to dance down the road with no plan and see what would happen. And there were a few people who did have actual plans to get a job, have a family, and they knew what kind of house they wanted, but we all just kind of really felt sorry for them. <laughs> and I, I mentioned the word meaning uh, earlier and trying to find reasons to make art, to ask ourselves what we're making and why we're making it. 
Maybe the answer is, of course, simply to make something beautiful, something true, something, maybe something the world has never seen before. But meaning is a very tricky word. And as a young artist, I came into the art world at a time when minimalism was the biggest, most exciting idea. And we were all extremely focused on our work and on something we called the edge. Now, many essays were written about the edge, and we discussed it with passion and a lot of, I have to say, urgency. Now, maybe minimalism was as much of philosophy, really, as uh, an art movement or style. But meanwhile, the things we made looked exactly like boxes, light fixtures, and wooden planks. They looked like stacks of sheetrock. They were stacks of sheetrock. But for us, they were about size and weight and physical presence. They had meaning. They were about our relationship to them and to space. But eventually, like so many things, the edge as an art mov movement disappeared. Pretty soon, no one was talking about the edge anymore. And so it just disappeared. The act of seeing itself became the art form and the act of pointing to something. And it almost didn't matter what it was. Anyway. If I tried to make you interested in the edge today, I'm not sure I could really do it. Maybe if I really tried, I could make you care about why we cared about the edge, how we looked almost desperately for art to mean something, how we looked for something, anything, to hold on to. Now, I do want to say a couple more things about money and its relationship to art. As a young artist, I never thought my work would pay the rent. Once, when I filled out my income tax, I got a note from the IRS that said, if you deduct this amount for supplies again next year, you will have to declare your profession a hobby. <laughs> now, I grew up as a rich kid, and it was a great way to start in life, but not because I had a pony and lots of toys, but because I saw first that I saw firsthand that, that having money didn't necessarily make people happy. And in fact, I saw that they were spending most of their time and energy getting more things and then sort of psychotically protecting them. So learning this early saved me a lot of time. And then there was my friend, Richard Nonis, and his advice, and I often complained to him that I had to get a job to pay my rent to support myself as an artist, and he was so annoying. He just kept saying the same thing over and over again. He said, just do your work. And I kept saying, but Richard, that's so impractical. I mean, I have to have a place to live. And, and he kept saying, do your work, and the rest will happen. And this seemed like some kind of ridiculous magical thinking. And it took me a long time, a very long time, to understand what he was saying, which was, put your work first, and the rest really will fall in place. Because the thing you put first will have your very best energy. Now, you're probably as skeptical about this as I was, but please, just do me a favor trust me on this, just try it. Now, another important thing, oh, as a, as a tip, I, I want to I give you, it's a quick and specific method to figure out which projects to do, and I use this all the time. So when you're deciding uh, to take something on or not, it has to have, for me, two of three things, fun, interesting, or money. It can't just be one thing. And you can't always choose fun and interesting. And there are these checks and balances in the system. You can only choose the same pair two times out of three. So if you need this to, to balance things out, I'm, I'm just saying this, this is a formula that really does work. And now, as I said, we now live in a world where art has finally become actually money itself. And the main feature of NFTs, for example, is ownership. Who really owns it and who can trade it? But here's the problem. The, the, amount of computing power to solve complicated math problems in order to earn the cyber currency that allows for authentication of the ownership means that it drains power from the grid that sustains actual life. Now, in an effort to siphon yet more energy, Bitcoin miners are locating their facilities next to nuclear reactors. So money has finally become totally and literally completely toxic. Now, another thing that it's important to remember is who you're working for. I remember seeing a headline in a British newspaper that said, Britain loses two million man hours this year from illness in the workforce. And I thought, wait a second. Since when did you owe Britain your man hours? And now they're coming up short. And it's kind of your fault. I mean, who are you working for? Now, of course, our own government has sold off so many things, hospitals, schools, prisons, power plants, and armies. They've all become privatized. They're businesses with ultimate mandate of satisfying the investors. So here are some other things to think about while trying to make art in a world where everything is being bought and sold. So 
first, I, I just think this constant rating of everything has got to stop. You know, you're always rating yourself, rating your last Uber ride, rating your meals, rating your friends, rating movies. It's exhausting. I mean, it's this, this um, constant assigning value to everything and putting it all on a scale. What are you worth? And what's that person over there worth? And we've become like a massive accounting firm. And then you have to construct an appealing enough persona as an artist to enter the job market or design a plausible enough personality to have a chance on your dating app. So everything is for sale, and we don't even see it anymore. Meanwhile, none of us know where this is going. Will our cities become more and more like camps for the homeless? Will there be a civil war? Is there a way to work inside the corporate art world? Will art become just another tradable commodity? And we, when these things start running through my mind, I think of something Ursula Le Guin said. She said, we live in capitalism. Its power seems inescapable. And then again, so did the divine right of kings. Another thing I want to mention, since people crave it almost as much as money, is fame. And I've had what was called a name uh, for about 40 years now, and I have to say, it's no picnic. But, uh, you know, even picnics are rarely picnics, but with all the ants and the spoiled mayonnaise and, you know, Uncle Al, who's always complaining about everything all the time. And speaking of fame, where did Warhol's 15 minutes actually come from? I have a theory about this, and it's not something I've ever read, but I do remember a headline in the New York Post that, that Andy really liked, and the headline was boldface, 15 minutes, really huge. And below that was, it's the time it takes for a nuclear warhead to reach New York from Moscow. Now, I was married for a long time to a famous person, and fortunately, he had a real sense of humor about it, and he would take his fame off you know, whenever he felt like it, just kind of like his black leather jacket. And as for me, when someone on the street suddenly shrieks my name, I never take it personally. I don't say, oh, gee, thanks, I'm so glad you like my work. Uh, you know, what do you, what do, you do? Uh, no, I, I see it really as someone who is surprised to see a person from the second dimensional world, the world of media, who has suddenly appeared in the third dimension. And they weren't really exactly sure the second dimension was a real place anyway, and they're surprised and kind of proud to see this. So I just have to congratulate them. You know, congratulations, you've made the connection between the second and third dimension. Good job. <laughs> but back to stories and how hard it is to tell what's real, I'm thinking of freedom and what it means now. I became an artist because I wanted to be free. But what does that really mean? Meanwhile, there are massive and violent arguments about what freedom means in this country. And strangely, the idea of freedom is often linked to death, as you can see in our national arguments about guns and abortion. So for some people, guns are freedom, and for others, guns are death. For some people, abortion is freedom, and for others, abortion is death. Americans are so hardcore. Give me liberty or give me death. Freedom, fame, and death all in one package. But here we are, we're artists, we're not philosophers. It's just, you know, if we had just ideas, we would publish them, not bother to put them into shapes and colors and time frames. Images, though, ha can have an enormous power, and they can hit you before you know how to put them into words. Now, a few years ago, I was the artist in residence in Austin, Texas, and around this time, people were talking seriously, suddenly, about overturning Roe v. Wade. And at the time, this seemed like crazy. It seemed unthinkable, and it was surreal to be part of these conversations. Now, the real center, though, of this university, its heart was football. Now, there was a huge stadium on campus, and over every entrance, there was an enormous, stylized head of a Texan longhorn steer. So, once during a panel discussion, freedom and abortion rights came up, and I was saying how hard it is to conceptualize things, and then for some reason I just kind of began to sort of like elaborate on this theme, and I said, you know, it's like a, you know, uh, every time I go to a game, I, I look up and I see that enormous uterus in, over every entrance to the stadium. It just looks so kind of weird, kind of fetishistic with the fallopian tubes, the eggs, the ovaries, and the cervix, so perfectly drawn. It's just so graphic, it's just so strange. And I watched their faces like kind of fall, as the longhorn steer turned into the uterus, and I realized that in one sentence, I'd made myself the most unpopular artist in residence ever in Texas, <laughs> because I changed the way they saw something. And once you see something, it, you can't unsee it. You can't get it out of your mind. 
Now, meanwhile, it's up to you, or some of you anyway, to invent new ways to make art that reflects our situation, um, sound people to find new ways to tour in a world with more limited resources, writers to invent new ways to write and distribute books, filmmakers to investigate new forms, new ways to tell stories that are about the way time is now, visual artists to find ways to make a really interesting NFT, and for everybody to learn to use technology well and not to overestimate it. I myself am a geek, a person who loves technology, but I actually really don't trust it. After all, it's basically just black boxes, components, and algorithms and programs wrapped in a corporate matrix. It doesn't actually deserve our praise or our fear, and it can easily get in the way. Now, my friend Justin describes the internet as assisted living for millennials, which I think is a great description, and given how they are using it, and I'm guessing that you Zoomers are more part of, uh, you're more aware of this uh, true nature of this as, as you've just spent the last few years exclusively Zooming. Now, me, I, I don't think technology will save the world. And somehow the tech fire engines are going to swoop in at the last minute and put out the fires. So if you actually are counting on this to happen at this point, you probably need to think again. But I'd like to quote a cryptog cryptographer who said one of my favorite things about technology. He said, if you think technology will solve your problems, you don't understand technology, and you don't understand your problems. Now, I have to say that for the, about the last four years, I wake up almost every morning in a state of despair. It's not pictures or words, it's just a feeling, the heavy weight of the war, of continuous, unending mass murders, of racism, of the collapse of nature, the threat of nuclear annihilation, the lack of empathy, the rise of fascism. Probably like you, it just makes me want to go back to sleep forever. So when I do is I just try to talk myself for, for, to talk to myself for a while, remind myself that not, no one can really prove that things are getting better or worse. This can take a while, but I never actually get up until I find something good. Sometimes it's just a cup of coffee, or it could be a kind of like hopeful idea. For example, I mean, we do know that the uh, ov life overall on the biggest scale is getting more complex. Evolution just tends towards complexity. A modern horse can outrun a prehistoric one. We've become more dexterous. We have bigger brains, longer lives. We are not slowly sliding down the evolutionary slope, losing our eyesight, our dexterity, slowly devolving into one-celled creatures, turning basically into pond scum. No, we are actually going in the opposite direction. And this, on the whole, seems like a good thing. And in the short term, however, we can't see much, really. We can't really say with confidence that your generation is going to live in a world that is collapsing or burning or becoming worse and worse. Because, you know, any minute there could be a massive, totally fatal new virus that wipes out 90% of the human population and the survivors get to start all over again using all the great things that humans have made but knowing all the pitfalls. I mean, it could be amazing. <laughs> but not knowing uh, is our condition and it can be the meaning of our work, it's direction. Now, I'm an optimist, not because it makes any sense. It's for completely selfish reasons that I will have a better life, a happier life, as an optimist. Now, this is not a rational choice, it's just purely practical. But it does take a lot of effort sometimes. I have an exhibition up now at the Hirshhorn in DC, and I filled one large room with drawings, and with a lot of words and quotes and slogans and things I try to keep in mind to cheer myself up, like, never trust a wizard, uh, some things are defined by their absence, or in the words of Tom Waits, always keep a diamond in your mind. So we're coming to an end here, and, and, and uh, maybe it's too late in this little talk to mention this, but I, I, I have to say that I do believe in angels. And I'm thinking now of a Greek angel named Kairos, and he's the angel of opportunity, the angel of the exact right moment, the right millisecond to shoot the arrow, reach the target, and this is a good angel to think about if you're an artist, because timing is everything. But angels are everywhere, and in Buddhism, there's a concept called the angel, tree, the, the jewel tree, and it's a the great teacher and Buddhist thinker, Bob Thurman, who describes the tree the best. And this is a tree that you can conjure up in front of you, and on it are all the people that you love and admire from all eras, from all time, real, imaginary. They're all up there on the tree, hanging like jewels. All the greatest artists and musicians and painters and people who are capable of great insights or great love or invention or whatever it is that you're looking for, they're there, and they're all 
on your side. And they're there explicitly to help you. And you don't have to be a Buddhist to picture this group of the greatest people from all time, according to you. So you just pick them, you put them up there, and they're, the, they're there for you, ready to advise you, to console you, to answer your questions. And they really apparently have nothing better to do at this point. Now, the, there are teachers everywhere, though, and, and it seems like all my life I've looked for them. My best and closest teacher was my husband, Lou Reed, who knew how to live in the moment and how to make music and how to feel things. His song lyrics often slide through my mind and help me focus. Hang on to your emotion, he sings sometimes. Or I'll be your mirror, reflect what you are, in case you don't know. Or words from the song he wrote for me called The Power of the Heart. Thank you, Lou. Now, last week, I was in Chicago, my hometown, and reconnected to my childhood friend, Bill Ayers, who was one of the weathermen who went underground here in Chinatown when he worked as a cook for years. And he reminded me of some of the many ways that art, love, and social justice can merge. And when I was at Barnard, I was a member of SDS and sat with Mark Rudd and hundreds of other people over in Lowe Library protesting the war and racism and staging teach-ins about the injustices of capitalism. Our mantra was, the people with the problems are the people with the solutions. Now today, those people, those people with the problems and the solutions are you. So here are some last parting thoughts. Don't forget to go outside. Try something you've never done. Break as many rules as you want to. Be kind to each other. Remember, it's the people with the problems who will find the solutions. And I can never resist sharing the words of my teacher, Mingyur Rinpoche, who said, try to practice how to feel sad without actually being sad. Now, this is a really great distinction, to be able to feel sad without becoming sad, because there are many sad things in the world. And if you pretend they're not there, you're an idiot. <laughs> but above all, do not become sad yourself. The reason that we are here is to make art. The reason we are here is to make really great art. The reason we are here is to have a really, really, really good time. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, we should all go home now. That was so beautiful. <laughs> it's really something to, to observe someone who has such a unique voice, both in her spoken voice and in her written voice, and a confidence to use it for all of you. It was really something to watch this. And she was nervous about it. She wasn't sure it was going to be good. And it was fabulous. <laughs> oh. OK. <laughs> really makes me so happy to hear her. Okay. Um, okay, so this is actually your moment. Uh, this is the recognition of the graduates. It's a big deal. Um, so the way it's going to go is the chairs of the programs are each going to address you. And then, with the assistance of the directors of academic administration, who you all know well, are going to present the degrees to all of you, and it's going to go in this order. It's going to be Jack Leshner for Film MFA and MA in Film and Media Studies, assisted by Hannah Sifu. And then it's going to be Brian Kulik for Theater, assisted by Lauren Elmore. And then Nicola Lopez for Visual Arts and Sound Arts, assisted by Laura Mesquera. And then it's going to be Liz Harris for Writing, assisted by Frank Winslow. And so we're going to start with Jack Leshner, Chair of Film. Thank you, Carol. I have the unenviable task of following the brilliant Laurie Anderson. Uh, but the good news is she was so brilliant that it really doesn't matter what I say for the next five minutes because you'll still be thinking about what she said. So it takes all the pressure off. 
Um, I'm going to be speaking mostly to the uh, 2022 graduates, but 2021 and 2020 graduates know that this all applies to you too. Um, the last three years might have been the worst time ever to go to film school. <laughs> you chose to study an art form that's all about collaboration and physical space, and then the pandemic made it impossible to share physical space. You had to take classes remotely. Your education, like everything else about your lives, was thoroughly disrupted. But the pandemic wasn't just an annoyance preventing you from making your student films on schedule or from taking classes in person. Many of you lost loved ones to COVID-19. The fear of contagion and the strain of isolation have been a constant source of stress and anxiety. We've all been through the kind of extreme emotional experience that is more commonly found in movies and television than in our everyday lives. And yet, like the heroes of a movie, you met the moment and found inner resources that you didn't know you had. You found ways to collaborate all over the world. You channeled your experiences into films and screenplays and pilots and thesis papers. You did outstanding work against odds greater than any previous Columbia film students have ever faced. Whatever happens next, you have already made us proud. And what will happen next? Well, the last three years might have been the worst time ever to go to film school, but right now might be the best time ever to graduate from film school. If there's one thing we learned at the height of the pandemic, it's the value of art and entertainment. When times are tough, we want stories. Stories that take us out of our lives so that we can see our lives anew. Stories that allow us to empathize with others so that we can see the common threads that bind us. Stories that delight us, enlighten us, and challenge us. Stories that make us laugh and thrill and cry and think. You already had stories to tell when you came to the Columbia Film Program. Now you have the tools with which to tell them. Now you have the Columbia Film faculty and prior graduates of the program as a lifelong resource of mentorship and experience to draw on. Now, uh, many of you have teaching experience that will allow you to flourish in academia if that's the path you choose. Now you have each other, the friends, allies, and collaborators who can help you bring your stories to life on screens big and small. And now you know you have the strength and resilience to get through anything. If you saw most of the films in the Columbia University Film Festival over the last two weeks, as I did, then you know how extraordinarily gifted this class of storytellers is. When you entered the program just ahead of the pandemic, the world didn't know what was about to hit it for the worse. But now, as you leave the program, I can say that the world doesn't know what's about to hit it for the better. You're what's about to hit it. Your stories, your insight, your wit, your empathy, your passion, your skills, your humanity. The world doesn't know it wants them, but it does. It needs them. It needs you. Right now might be the best time ever to graduate from film school, and I cannot wait to see what happens next. I would now like to introduce the film directors, excuse me, the film program's director of academic administration, Hannah Seifu, who will read the names of the 2021 and 22 graduates in film and media studies, followed by the MFA graduates in film. We're just waiting for them to come up. start with uh, the graduates from the Film and Media Studies program. They are graduating with a Master's of Arts. Zhang Ang An. Annie Berman. Wiebe Kopman. Marissa C. Dabaka. Julia Andrea Delgadillo. Carlos Gutierrez Aza.
Yu Long Hu. Ryan Hupp. Su An Kang. Maya Koto Mori. Elong Li. Xing Shu Li. Sam Miller. Carly Rodriguez. Isabella Rossetti. Dennis Sun. Somaya Vutz. Lin Cheng. Eileen Zhou. Xian So. Now we will begin with uh, the MFA in film. <laughs> Holly Andrews. Devin Armstrong. Oh, for goodness sake. <laughs> Archibald Bamanu. <laughs> Jacob Berman. Chris, Christopher Blanco. Jonathan Brown. Ronald Brown. Daniel Byers. Sushant Chaudhry. Layla Chadetic, <laughs> Su Wei Chen, <laughs> Hua Shan Chen, Johnson Chang, <laughs> Stephanie Coriatis, <laughs> An Chu, <laughs> Naja Asata Diop. J.D. Dooling, Antonia Frias, Caitlin Farrell, Stephanie Fine, Lauren Fodron, Peter Forbes, Scott Dramolis. Lauren Getzman. <laughs> Justin Gonzalez. Fernando Gonzalez Ortiz. Andrea Gucher. Elizabeth Grupp. Jorge Granados Ross. Neta Jabelli. Christian Jones. <laughs> John K. Jones. Agnes Carlson. Shannon Kelly. Robert Kerr. Sushma Kedorpao. Max Kimball. Sandra Lacey. Lou Lee. Rani Yavarias. King King Lou. Natalia Luque. Mona Man. Constanza, Constanza Maluf. Benjamin Martin. Grace Merriman. Selman Nakar. 
a lot of paper here, guys. <laughs> Jessiel Newton Barnal. Olive Nusso. Nicholas Nyoff. Sonia Olnek. Gleb Osensiski. Cecilia Otero. Aiden Paris. Moara Passioni. Olivia uh, Alexandria Parata. Harrison Bunkley Perkins. Mariana Safon. Kio Sijiki. Katia Skakun. Tyler St. Pierre. Madison Stein. Jasmine Tanucci. Erica Ruth Tennyson. Donovan Toledo. Cooper Troxel. Constance Sang. Gabrielle Urbanite. Mira Vusadai. Brian Velsor. Xiaoning Wang. Saladin White II. Christina Wood. Marcus Wolf. Shei Zhu. Tony Yang. Christina Yoon. Bo Fan Jiang. Zheng Yi Hao. Thank you so much. Congratulations, guys. Um, thank you. I'm doing theater. Okay, so when I was on the cusp of graduating, my teacher told me a parable about an artist, an emperor, and the perfect crab. Bear with me. It goes like this. An emperor seeks out a renowned artist and asks, can you draw me the perfect representation of a crab? The artist says that such a thing is possible, but in order to render the perfect crab, it will require a year's worth of work. During this time, the artist will need a villa on a hill with a stone garden and his own private menagerie. The emperor agrees. The artist is given all that he's asked for a year transpires. The emperor returns. He requests the artist's rendering of the perfect crab, and the artist confesses, I miscalculated. In order to produce the perfect crab, I need a much larger villa with a second stone garden and an outdoor aviary to complement my private menagerie. The emperor agrees, but he warns that if in a year from now there is no rendering of the perfect crab, he will cut off the artist's right hand. The artist agrees. Another year passes. The emperor arrives and he demands his perfect crab. The artist brings forth an empty sheet of paper and then takes out a pen and in one complete and elegant gesture draws the perfect crab. 
End of story. That's it, I said to my teacher. He said, that's it. He smiled and he left me to figure this out, uh, what the meaning was and how I could construe this into some kind of piece of graduation advice. So here I'm going to try to do it. Uh, I have to confess that when I first heard this tale, I was somewhat distracted by the artist's extravagant demands. I knew this wasn't the point of the parable, but I still couldn't help admiring the sheer chutzpah of the artist. Why be shy about making art? It's hard work. There's no shame in getting people to recognize this, and even more importantly, recompense artists accordingly. But ultimately, I had to concede that such an interpretation felt a tad tangential and unnecessary since the invention of agents. So, if the parable is not about the proper remuneration of services rendered, then what's it about? I suppose it has to do with art, time, and perfection. A perfect work of art, if there is such a thing, has its own unique timetable and simply cannot be rushed. It doesn't matter how big a villa or how large a reflecting pool, the perfect crab is going to take however long it takes. Masterpieces happen when they happen. And whether we like it or not, the gestation process remains a mystery. This reminds me of that French poet who put a note on his door at night while he slept. The sign read, quiet please, poet at work. In this regard, we're always working, even when we don't think we are. Believe it or not, you are working right now while I'm standing up here yammering at you. Somewhere deep inside of you, you're in the midst of crafting your perfect crab, whether that's a painting, a poem, or a performance. My teacher's parable, I suppose, is about how one has to be patient and just let that perfect grab, crab grow on its own accord. It will arrive when it arrives, emperors be damned. That certainly was the gestalt of my generation. Take your time. It happens when it happens. My graduating class's motto was, we can, we will, when we want to. <laughs> we had that luxury, but I'm not sure your generation does. Given the troubling state of the world, I'm not sure we can wait. We need your perfect crab now. We need your help to make sense of things. We need your passion, your vision, your inspiration. We need you to instruct us, conjole us, and even incite us into right action. We need you to wake us up, make us take note, and re-enchant this fallen world of ours. We need you more than ever. So, what are you waiting for? Make your crab. Change our world now. Thank you. It's my great pleasure uh, to introduce the theater program's director of academic administration, Dr. Lauren Brett Elmore, who will read the names of the 20, 2021, 20, and 2022 MFA graduates in theater. Jillian Abbott. You didn't fill out this, Anita. Oh, no. Anita Abedinejad. <laughs> Thank you. Julian Abuskamp. Andrew Agress. <laughs> Agress, excuse me. Robert. James Armstrong III. <laughs> Anya Banerjee. <laughs> Tom Blucci. <laughs> Blucci. 
Elana Marie Bulos. Michael Branyan. John Bruner. John Henry Carey. Sean Chia. Harrison Corthell. Damla Joshkin. Cassie Cushing. Catherine Darty Smiley. Oof, here we go. Isaiah. Ola. <laughs> um, yes, Dodo Williams. Thank you. Kristen Dodson. Amy Eingold. Ida Esmiley. Danielle Fetter. Rhody Jordan. Delise Fleming. Caitlin Foster. Vishnikova. Christian Goody. Fiona Gory Hines. Anne Guadagnino. Dylan Guerrera. Thank you. Emma Hughes. Nathaniel Janice. Amalia Johnson Jones. Michael Karachi. Joshua Kim. Tatiana Kugel Holy. Holel. <laughs> Her real name is not there. Sorry. Gulen Lungbrook. Each one. Jane. Ch Jane Chow Lu. <laughs> Clayton McNerney. Meryl McNally. Morgan McNaught. Hal Myers. Rebecca Miller Kratzner. Greg Nani. Kira Nee Quirk. Z Pong. Hey, you did it. Von Paul. Anthony Othello Pratt Jr. Samantha Pine. Sabi, Anna Maria, Ramirez, Chahon. Christina Cha Ramos. Vanessa Raybal. John Robin. Jacob K. Robinson. Rafaela Rosenberg. Allison Savino. Chloe Sear. Paula Alexandra Soto. Jay Stuhl. I don't need that. Yenna Sung. Brigitte Lenore Tima Burdett. Stephanie Jean Toussaint. Aladdin Ula. <laughs> Kanika Vaish. Titus Van Hook. 
Merlixi Ventura. <laughs> Annie Wang. Let's go, Annie. Jay Wu. <laughs> George Yua Kim. Congratulations to the MFA graduates of the theater program of Columbia University. All right, theater is always a hard act to follow. <laughs> okay. I have three observations about the future that I would like to share with those of you graduating today and who have graduated in the last couple of years. Number one, the future is a mess. You know all about it, you read the news, you're tuned in, so I won't go into any detail. What I want to say is that as we face this messy future, you as artists have a crucial role to play and you are prepared for it. You know how to deal with messes, you're artists. You are used to finding ingenious solutions to the most complex situations and when there isn't a solution, you come up with a response. You are comfortable with the unknown. You know how to improvise how to access and leverage scarce resources, how to take a tiny spark of inspiration and fan it into a flame and then a roaring fire of enthusiasm. The future is full of insurmountable problems and it will hold failure. But you're alchemists and you know how to turn the impossible into the incredible. You know how to mine failure, digging deeper until you find the nugget of potential that brings us back to the realm of possibility and promise. So the future is a mess, but if we get to choose the team we're on as we face it, I want to be on your team. Not that this is about teams or winning, which brings me to my second point. The future is not about winning. The future is shared. There's no such thing as a private future. In fact, that's just the kind of thinking that created the mess that we were talking about earlier. So you are prepared for this because making art is something that we do and have always done in solidarity. Like the future, art is not about winning. There may be times when you feel the edge of competition. You see your peers getting some recognition, money, funding, opportunities that you're not getting at that given moment, but there is no finish line that you need to cross first. There is no race. We're artists. We're not racing each other. We're all running around in different directions anyway. <laughs> but we're in it together. So look around you, because this is your future sitting right next to you. Your future as an artist lies largely in the conversations, the collaborations, and the friendships that you have already built and that you will continually rely on. In these relationships, you are already deeply embedded in your future. Which brings me to my third point. The future is already here. As artists, the future is familiar territory. With every act of making, we acknowledge the future and also how it cleaves to the present. As you constantly poke and prod at the world around us, we turn it upside down, we shake it to see what hides inside. We are creating a guide for our future. It's a guide that is invariably built of the past and lodged solidly in the present. It is not a guide in the sense of an instructional map. It is a guide that is lived through which awareness is enlarged and experience is formed. It allows us passage to the future by connecting us through more dimensions to our present. As artists, we are creating the future by giving form to our now. So don't worry about the future because you're already there. Just keep on doing what you've been doing all along. Experiment, be true, Explore the things that feel exciting and relevant to you. Use new tools, use old tools. Use old tools in new ways. Respond, reflect, look outside, look inside. Build on tradition, be on the cutting edge. But the only way to do all or any of this is to be present. 
If the future is now, then to be in the now is to be the future, which is exactly what you are. You are our future. And now I would like to introduce uh, the Sound Art and Visual Arts Program Director of Academic Administration, the amazing Laura Mosquera, <laughs> who will read the names of the 2020, 2021, and 2022 MFA graduates in visual art and sound arts. Razal Ahmed. Oh <laughs> Catherine Blackburn. <laughs> I need <laughs> Linus Borgo. <laughs> Rosanna Caban. Ivana Carmen. <laughs> Kayla Mechi Chambers. <laughs> Hyochu Chian. <laughs> Noga Cohen. <laughs> Avishag Cohen Rodriguez. Alejandro Alejo Contreras. Joanna Cortez. Lauren Covey. Anthony Sertel Dean. Ian Decker. Hillary Devaney. <laughs> Fadal Fakuri. <laughs> Monica Felix Abote. <laughs> Linnea Gad. <laughs> Danielle Godisman. Jack Groves. Jonathan Harris. Oops. Jen Hassan. Juan David Hernandez Diaz. Aaron Elise Holland. Julia Jalowick. <laughs> Priscilla Jiang. <laughs> Sophie Koval. Why, <laughs> pardon me, why Lao? John Thomas Levy. <laughs> Breeze Lee. Joseph Liatella. Lin Liu. Xinyi Liu. Erica Mao. Rafaela Melson. Farah Mohammed. Woo! 
Keika Okamoto. Mimi Park. Julia Pontes. Denise Griselda Reyes. Abigail Robinson. Kristen Shea. Kelsey Schwetz. Ryan Wang. Elsie Williams. Ishan Wu. Yuri Yuan. Lizzie Zelter. Congratulations, visual arts and sound art grads. Congratulations, writers! I'm going to linger a little longer on what you went through to get here and how amazing you were to do so. Whatever you, ex <laughs> Whatever you expected life to be inside the halls of Columbia's graduate writing program, in your innocent morning, pre-Morningside Heights, pre-pandemic days, I believe it is safe to say that your experience turned out to be dramatically different than anything you could have imagined. Your classmates became miniaturized as tiny squares on a computer grid. Your social life, insofar as it existed at all, consisted of plugging into social media and sending plaintive or irritated messages out to a few fr the few friends you managed to make before all the drawbridges went up, and your faculty contacts became remote in the new sense of the word. Anyway, your professor on the screen, with his or her children and cats and dogs playing bit parts in the pedagogical experience taking place, had little resemblance to the old film image of the Tweedy University tutor sitting near a cozy fire surrounded by eager acolytes. No, the stresses of COVID and the medical, cultural, and political upheavals that formed the backdrop of your exile from Dodge or the big house demanded the endurance of superheroes and made your journey more like the Indianapolis 500 than an Ivy League idol. On the other hand, the determination of the faculty to offer what they could to compensate for the bad cards you've been dealt was also part of the picture. A virtual blizzard of online panels, readings, colloquies, coffee houses, and other events were dreamed up to keep alive our connection, as well as our bonds with a larger literary universe. We worked hard to remain a vital community, however difficult that was as COVID plowed through our families, our friends, and the world. Did all that activity lessen the anxiety that hung over you like a black blob? It didn't. But one reason why, despite the barriers you encountered, you still muddled through, which you did, still grew as essayists, poets, critics, reporters, and novelists, which you did, still managed to hold on to the voice you discovered to belong uniquely to you, like your handwriting, which you also did, was that for writers, acknowledgement of the darker side of life is bred into their bones. Whether they consider it a curse or a blessing, it's an inextricable part of their everyday thinking. Some scholars believe that the present era represents the final gasp of the post-World War II everything is possible for some 
better living through chemistry phase of popular dreams, a place that still lives on in TV ads. But that land was rarely in inhabited by writers. Our scribbling progenitors were almost never untouched by the turmoil of poverty or the wounds of family sorrows. There has, in fact, been a continuous line of writers from Dickens, Dostoevsky, Orwell and Kafka through Langston Hughes, Primo Levi, Natalia Ginsburg, Toni Morrison, and Chinua Achebe, to Jessamyn Ward, Chimamanda Adichie, and Per Peterson, whose work has been deeply marked by the dramatic misfortunes they lived through. Don't get me wrong. I'm not recommending that you need to work in a blacking factory, as Dickens did, to fully grasp the complexity of the human condition. What I am suggesting is that pushing on through hard times, thinking complexly, and having truth-telling as a goal serve as a kind of armor that it is a precious thing and that you have. So on behalf of the writing faculty, I again congratulate you and wish you joy and every success, but will also remind you that as Flaubert told us, the most glorious moment of your life is not the so-called day of success, but those days when out of rejection and despair, you, f you feel a rise in you, a challenge to life, and the promise of future accomplishments. Or as he put it another time in a far simpler way, writing is a dog's life, but for Flaubert, the only one worth living. So go on and live it, and congratulations again. And now it is my pleasure to introduce our incomparable uh, DAA, Frank Winslow. Leah Aberlink. Mariah Adcox. Antonio Adesi. Celine Ayanje Rocha. Be Anena. Edison and Angel, Angel Bello. Kylie Bentz. Bryson Boyd. And friend. Amanda Breen. Thank you. Sophie Michael Brett. Chin. Ah. Julia Bergdorf. Daniel Burgess. Nicole Kaplan Kelly. Thank you. Eliza Barry Callahan. Sienna. Canales. Oh, no problem. Layton Cassidy. Congratulations. Suji Choi. Hello. Brooke Davis. Margot Demas. Audrey Dang. Elias Diacolias. Stephanie Dinsai. Thank you. 
Claire Doherty. Eva Dunsky. Charlie Dyroff. Michelle Duro. Don Alardo. Flora Field. So Sophia Florimbi, thank you. Rachel Audrey Galena Gilman. Ananda Naima Gonzalez. Francisco Gonzalez. Thank you. Ellie Graff. Lara Gruska. Hello. Douglas Hamilton Grenham. Lara Hart. Timothy Hatton. Sorry. Laura Head. Ithel. Ithel Ian Ebrahim. Muhammad Ali Jahangir. Colin Johnson. Kendra Ann Jones. Hello. Ariel Caden. Candice Kale. Zoe Contros Curl. Veronica Kellerman. Sarah Yukiko Klena. Maitu Kapolu. Micra Krasin. Krasnichi? Krasnichi. I will say these with much more confidence moving forward. Grace Larkin. Jamie Lung. Lauren Kraslin. Clark Hannah Taylor Lewis. Ryan Lonergan. Madeline Lucas? Lucas, thank you. Madeline Lucas. Sophia Mystorovich. Kristen M. Mallon. Paul McAdery. Cheryl McCourty. Maggie Mendito. Congratulations. Taylor Michael. Max Miller. Cameron Ray Morton. Oh, Adrian Moyo. Galina Nemirovsky. Galina Nemirovsky. Hello, Connor. Connor O'Burn. Thank you. Olighton Antonia Oladipo. <laughs> Sheer Orner. Laura Jordan Palmer. Ryan Peterson. Stephanie Philp. Saida Rod Rahman. 
Annetta Randall. Sonia Reddy. Ellen Rethwish. Colleen Reynolds. Lena Richards. Margaret Richardson. Thank you. Margaret Rogers. Hello. Abigail Ronner. Rachel Catherine Rukert. Nicole Saldariaga. Shalvi Jaxe Shah. Woo! Getting ready for a run. Chelsea Smith. Not a run, but a dance. Marcel Sherwaro. Rebecca Smiley. Kayla Spirito. William Thomas. Nora Rose Thomas. Yeah, Bojdani, thank you. Jasmine Bojdani. Thank you. Elizabeth von Klim Klimerhausen. Elizabeth von Klimerhausen. Okay, just one second. This was Elizabeth von Klemer Klemerer. I apologize. Clemmerier, and this is Sasha von, <laughs> von Olderhausen. <laughs> Feel like I'm never going to live that one down. <laughs> Emily Weitzman. <laughs> and Brianna Williams. Thank you very much, writing graduates. Congratulations. We are almost there, okay. Now, for the absolutely final conferring of degrees, will all the graduates from this year, from 2020, and from 2021, please stand. And stay standing. Okay. Having completed the requirements for the Master of Fine Arts or Master of Arts, I now confer on you these degrees with all the rights and privileges thereto attached. Congratulations. We wish you... We wish you great success and joy in your lives. May your spirits always be free to make the work close to your hearts, and may you find ways to use your intelligence and your talents to help protect this planet and to always be committed to improving this world. You are all now our alumni and forever part of the School of the Arts, Columbia University in the city of New York, and the Columbia Alumni Association. Congratulations.